A brief heads up in case you watch these videos with young kids. 98% of this video is about natural history and an incredible scientist. But toward the beginning, there are a couple of specific mentions of violence. Nothing is detailed, nothing is graphic in any way, but I wanted to give you a heads up just in case. Thanks! In 1990, fossils were found at an iron mine in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. At the time, they were considered fossils of the oldest organism on Earth that you could see without a microscope. And by some counts, they're still tied for the oldest macroscopic fossils ever found. But this isn't just the story of ancient life on Earth. It's also the story of the scientist who found these fossils. It's not one I see told very often, and I think it's pretty spectacular. This is the story of Zhu Ming Han. Once upon a time, around 1924, in a small village in East Central China, a boy was born who'd come to be known as Zhu Ming Han. He lived in a large family surrounded by relatives, including aunts, uncles, cousins, and at least seven siblings. But it wasn't a peaceful, stable childhood. During this time in China, there were power struggles between political groups, violent conflicts involving warlords, and in the 1930s, Japan invaded in a conflict that would kick off World War II. So at times, Zhu Ming's childhood was traumatic and chaotic. Many details I won't include here, but you can find more reading in the YouTube description if you're interested. To give you a sense of what kind of thing we're talking about, though, when Zhu Ming was only five, he was kidnapped by bandits for a ransom and held for nearly two months before someone seems to have taken pity on him and let this little kid go. Later, he then had to testify against those bandits and witnessed at least one of them being executed. Ultimately, his family started to move, first 20 miles away and then another 40. And really, Zhu Ming wouldn't stop moving in some capacity or another until he was done with graduate school. Meanwhile, on the other side of the globe, a very different sort of problem was unfolding in the small city of Ishpeming, Michigan. There, what's now the Cleveland Cliffs Iron Company had been mining iron since the mid-1800s, but they would soon start to run out of high-grade ore. They needed a way to make the lower-quality ore smeltable or to upgrade it, or else their days were numbered, as were the hundreds of jobs they created. But for now, back to China. Throughout the 1930s, Zhu Ming studied at multiple schools, moving often thanks to conflicts and war. Still, his father stressed the importance of education, and so Zhu Ming continued down that winding path, hopefully on the way to studying chemistry or medicine. But then something happened that would change not only his life, but the lives of thousands of others. When he took his college entrance exam, he didn't qualify to study either chemistry or medicine. He'd qualified to enter the School of Geology, despite not knowing what geology was at the time. Still, and presumably after a consult with a peer or a dictionary, that's where he enrolled. But how does this link up with Ishpeming? Well, after he was done with his bachelor's degree, Zhu Ming became one of only three students in the country who qualified to study geology abroad. And for his graduate work, a colleague suggested he head to Ohio's University of Cincinnati. The colleague had connections there. So in 1948, in his early 20s, Zhu Ming found himself getting ready to cross an ocean. And he also found himself saying goodbye to his father for the last time. In the coming years, his father would be executed as part of a complicated political situation, possibly as retribution for something that happened more than a decade prior. And because of the takeover of communism and travel restrictions between China and the United States, Zhu Ming wouldn't learn about this until years later. So Zhu Ming came to the United States and earned a master's degree, followed by virtually all of a PhD. And eventually, in 1953, he found himself accepting a full-time job as a microscopist from none other than the Cleveland Cliffs Iron Company. Zhu Ming settled in Ishpeming, a city that was then about 9,000 people. And there, he got to work 
on the iron problem. At this time, Cleveland Cliffs was earnestly trying to figure out how to run the first low-grade iron ore processing plant in the area. The future of their company depended on it. And Zooming Han played a major role in making this happen. During what would become a long career at Cleveland Cliffs, he was in charge of evaluating ores and occasionally dealing with plant operations and problems with product quality. Sometimes this meant he'd have to figure out what minerals were contaminating the ore and messing with the production process. And with hard work and a strong sense of curiosity, he was good at this. He found ways to make iron pellets stronger, remove contaminants, and more easily identify impurities. And over the years, he worked with samples from almost every iron formation in the world. To summarize, here's what one of Han's biographers said. Han's team's efforts saved the mines of the Marquette Iron Range from closure and allowed them to prosper into the 21st century. He went beyond textbook training. Cleveland Cliffs would send him problems from its mining locations around the world, and he would solve them. But here's where the story takes a turn. Zooming wasn't just interested in iron, he was also deeply curious in general. And in the 1970s, he noticed something odd at Cleveland Cliffs Empire Mine. It was a piece of rock that seemed to contain fossil-like material. Except this rock was close to two billion years old, and <laughs> there was no way life was big enough back then to leave visible fossils, you know, if there was life at all. So he moved on. But as you can guess, that's not the end of this story. In the 1980s, the general manager of the nearby Tilden mine found an interesting rock. And as interesting rocks tended to do, it ended up in the hands of Zhu Ming, who was just convinced it was a fossil, the same kind as he'd found in the 70s. So on his trips to the mines, he kept an eye out for one of these weird markings in its natural habitat. And that brings us to autumn 1990, when Zhu Ming was about 66 years old. On his way out of the Empire Mine one day, he spotted something and pulled over his truck. That, that was it. One of the fossils right there in the wall of the mine. The fossil was in a rock layer called the Nagani Iron Formation, a layer at least 1.8 billion years old. Zooming had found something incredible. Further study revealed that he'd found fossils of organisms called Grapania, but ones hundreds of millions of years older than any that had been found elsewhere in the world. Based on the evidence he had, he and his co-author, Dr. Bruce Reniger, wrote a paper announcing they'd identified the oldest macroscopic organisms ever found, the oldest singular fossilized creatures you could see without a microscope. And they may still be tied for that record. I say that with hesitation because of how our knowledge of the world has changed since the 90s. When Zooming co-authored that paper, evidence suggested that the Nagani Iron Formation was about 2.1 billion years old. But since then, revised estimates have proposed that this rock layer could be as young as 1.84 to 1.88 billion years old, in which case Grapania would lose its crown to other fossils. But also, here's the other part of it. What exactly had Han found? What are Grapania? One interpretation, the one put forth by Han and Runniger in the early 90s, is that these fossils represent a type of eukaryotic algae. One of the main features of eukaryotic life is that it keeps its DNA in a compartment in its cells called the nucleus. You're a eukaryote, for instance. And if Grapania are a type of algae, it's possible their bodies were made of multiple cells, or maybe they were one big cell with multiple nuclei. Eukaryotic cells are thought to have evolved at least 2.7 billion years ago, and today they fill the world. So Grapania could represent some of the early chapters of that story. But this interpretation's not a given. For instance, if Grapania were a multicellular eukaryotic algae, it's likely that they were breathing oxygen. Life can get energy a lot more efficiently if it's using oxygen compared to other processes, and efficiency is important if you're trying to do all sorts of complex things with multiple cells or nuclei. The trouble is, evidence from geology now suggests that Earth's atmosphere back then didn't have enough oxygen for creatures like Grapania to survive. 
So another option is maybe these critters were prokaryotes, organisms with no nucleus. Instead of being one creature, each spiral could also represent a collection of tiny bacteria that didn't breathe oxygen. And maybe the only reason we can see these creatures with the naked eye is because they're all clumped up in one spot. If that's the case, these fossils would still capture an incredibly old form of life. They would just be part of a very different story. And here I want to briefly stress that no matter what Grapenia is, this is still an amazing discovery. The thing about science is that it's a process. Sometimes there are uncertainties, and sometimes we learn new things that make us change what our understanding of the world is like. In science, there are some things we have really compelling evidence for, and it's okay if this isn't one of them yet. In any case, speaking of stories and processes and life, I'd argue that it's impossible to capture the fullness of someone's life story in a video this short. So if you'd like to read more about Zooming Han, again, there's some resources for you in the description. But to start winding down, one thing that really stood out to me about his life, besides his amazing work in the iron industry and how he put two and two together on Grapenia, is how much Zhu Ming Han seemed to enjoy his work and was dedicated to it. He had hobbies, absolutely, like bowling and fishing and taking photos and watching and listening to sports and spending time with his wife and three kids. But he was also someone who loved research. Like, he didn't even count finding these fossils as his most important work. That honor went to the study of iron ore. Even when he retired from Cleveland Cliffs, he kept an office there so he could keep exploring questions. And he kept researching until 2005, when he passed away at 80 years old. I was really struck by this man's curiosity and the way he kept solving problems and going after education and exploring questions throughout his life. It inspired me to keep asking questions of my own. And if you ever find yourself at a museum in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, or in one of many natural history museums around the world, consider keeping an eye out for Grapenia. Connecting with natural history like this is, to me, pretty special, as is learning about some of the amazing people behind the discoveries. Thanks as always for being here, and special thanks to the folks who support these videos on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee for helping to keep this series going. I hope you learned something that makes you think about the world just a little differently, and I'll see you soon.